Tá aí, galera. Dragon Age The Veil Guard, né? Um game que a gente começou a acompanhar. No fim, saiu o jogo do macaco, um monte de coisa. Estamos jogando ainda um monte de outras coisas e, no fim, eu não consegui acompanhar todas as novidades que saíram desse game, né? Saiu o preview, saiu o review. Review não, é preview, né? Primeiras impressões da galera. Inclusive, né, aqui no Brasil, o Lucky pôde viajar e testar. A gente vai dar uma olhada lá também. E eu perdi tudo isso, né? Então, agora eu reuni aqui vários vídeos da IGN, de alguns outros canais... Eu quero estar tá vendo junto de vocês sobre The Veil Guard, como que tá esse game. Esse game, se eu não estiver enganado, ele chega daqui um mês e meio, dia 31 de outubro, se eu não estiver enganado. Promete ser um baita game, né? Um jogão. E eu tô bem animado, bem curioso para saber mais sobre ele. Então, agora que saiu várias informações, eu baixei alguns vídeos aqui. Esse aqui mesmo é da IGN pra gente dar uma olhada. E consegui me inteirar, né? Eu quero me inteirar. É, junto de vocês que também talvez não tenham acompanhado tal, como está esse game? Se você está animado para ele ou não, comenta aqui, eu quero saber a sua opinião. Bora lá, vou colocar no início do vídeo, vamos acompanhar e ver como é que tá. Esse aqui é um vídeo de primeiras impressões da IGN, tá? What's up everybody? I'm Kat Bailey and this is our extended look at Dragon Age the Veil Guards gameplay. I'm here with BioWare lead developers Corinne Bush and John Epler. Corinne, what are we looking at today? Hey all, so today we're going to be helping out one of our companions, Gavrin. This is part of his personal arc to rescue the Griffins long thought extinct. We're going to take a quick journey through the lighthouse, your base of operations. We're going to head into the crossroads and make our way to the dark Perdão. swamps of Hoth. Perdão, galera, esse aqui não é o de preview, esse aqui é o de é um gameplay estendido de modo história, aparentemente, tá? Depois a gente vai ver o preview deles. Vamos lá. Spark Wetlands. So you're in the lighthouse as crane manager. This is your base of operations that you inherited. Eu preciso me atualizar, cara. Willingly from Solus. Uh, it is located in the Fade. It's where Solus Nossa, como tá lindo was isso, able véio. to start planning his rebellion against the Elven gods millennia ago. Right now, you and your team have occupied it, started to build it, started to shape itself around your personality. As Kryn mentioned, we are going to go talk to Davrin, which is who is located up above, and each of these spaces kind of shapes itself around your companions as you as they live there, as they basically spend their or their arcs in those rooms. And we see here the glowing light above indicates Davrin's ready for us. Let's check in with him. Something wrong? Got a message. A place called the Cauldron was attacked. At some sort of Grey Warden Tavern. It's a secret Warden readout. No idea what goes on there. And why are you involved? Because whatever attacked it sounds like the Gloom Howler. So earlier in Davern's arc, you were interested. Eu ainda não sei definir uh, como que é essa essa abordagem artística que eles estão usando, né? Mas me parece... Ele não é cartunesco, mas também não é realista. Fica entre ali o, o, o meio termo dos dois, né? E eu achei tão bonito, cara. De verdade, eu achei muito bonito a direção artística. O que eles é, é, usaram, né? Pra poder fazer o rosto dos personagens e tal. E o jogo inteiro, né? Não, não, não chega a ser algo cartoon, mas também não, não chega a ser totalmente realista. Ele fica ali no, no meio. E eu gostei disso introduced to his nemesis, the Gloomhowler creature that's been hunting and stalking wardens for quite some time. It's kidnapped a bunch of other griffins. War Davern has been trying to track it down. Now he's got a lead, so we're going to go find this and go tra track this thing down. Now, Davern, he prefers the direct approach. We're going to choose a tough response and see if we can get his approval. Then let's get rid of it. Have the same thought. What's left of the wardens are still licking their wounds. A voz desse cara. So we handle this alone. Just go to the cauldron and get the griffins back. You have to promise to behave, boy. Listen to every word I say, stay out of trouble, don't do anything dumb, and don't eat any. I think we get the point. Lancet and Remy told me there's a word for the bond between a griffin and warden moving as one. Turlum. Until Hassan and I have that. I'm supposed to keep him safe. I have to say that I find the Griffin adorable. And very importantly, I know this is a question on everyone's mind. Yes, you can pet a son. Well, thank goodness for that. Mm -hmm. And all right, what are we going to be doing next? 
He's up for this. All right. Thanks. We're going to finish getting this information from Davern on the Gloomhowler, and we'll be off to Hosburg in the crossroads. Team between Warden and Griffin starts by having faith in each other. Maybe. I suppose you were born for this sort of fight, boy. All talons and temper. And a sharp tongue to remind you of it. As long as he backs it up. Eu gosto de jogo so que tem escolhas, mano. So I assume can be helpful during the gameplay? Oh, absolutely. In fact, a lot of Davern's abilities revolve around calling a son in the heat of battle. I in particular love when you're going against enemies, you see a son swoop down, especially if it triggers a combo between your companions. As Quinn mentioned earlier, one of the interesting, the fun things we've done is if you see the lights on in a room, companions have something to say, you can see Harding up in that space there, uh, Nev behind you as well, and Bellara. But we have a mission ahead of us. We're going to go find the Gloom Howler if we can. And we're going to go through the crossroads in order to do that. And the crossroads, if you've played previous Dragon Age games, uh, Trespasser in particular, is a location in the, the Fade that contains a number of Alluvians, allowing you to travel across Thetis in a matter of minutes. But at this point, the crossroads are under assault by the other elven gods. It's a dangerous place, and we are going to be in for a bit of a fight. And this Alluvian, the Vira Voss, is the central focus point of the lighthouse. This is going to take us to Solus's pocket area of the crossroads, and it might look a little bit different from what you've seen in Trespasser. Can you tell us a little bit about the role that the crossroads plays in the structure and the gameplay? Yeah, so the crossroads is, again, it's the area that you spend a lot of time traveling through as you go from area to area. It's also a space that has, at one point, served as Solus's main base of operations and training ground for his rebellion against the Elven Gods. So as you go through it, you're going to find fragments of the past, things that Solus had done previously that are going to give you a bit of insight into Solus as a character, but also into the Elven Gods and their motivations. Some of my favorite content that you'll find if you go exploring in the crossroads is these opportunities to actually relive some of the memories Solus had during his rebellion. You actually get to take part in this ancient Vai rebellion. Focar to total here no we Solus, have the caretaker, né? a mysterious spirit that was actually here before Solus was and started to help Solus with his rebellion, but also to turn this into a safe haven for spirits. Again, as I mentioned before, the gods are assaulting the crossroads, so it's no longer the safe haven it once was. But you're going to work with this caretaker through quite a, a large amount of uh, ancillary content to rebuild this into that safe home for these creatures. That, if anyone knows Solus, he has a tremendous amount of affection for spirits. Obrigatoriamente oh, vai ter que jogar right. o jogo anterior, so cara. Senão vai ficar muito perdido. Here. And this time we're playing as a mage. Now, Mage is one of my favorite classes to play. Mago, it's primarily man. a ranged attack. Ah, no. And when we're surrounded <laughs> by swarming darkspawn, I really have to use a variety of strategies to control the battlefield. I'm going to use my heavy charged attacks to knock down these ah, ghouls. Mago é chato. Way. And of course, darkspawn are vulnerable é muito to OP. fire. <laughs> so we made sure to equip our fire staff, have our fire abilities. Cara, olha as habilidades, mano. You may notice something about the darkspawn too, that they look a little bit different than they have previously. And part of that is because Gillanane, who has been always been focused on using the blight as essentially a, a crafting material, a way to alter life itself, has been enhancing and changing these darkspawn as part of her army. Oh, ele invocou ali uma, uma amiga, isso. Opportunity. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the role that plays in the in the actual combat? Yes. So the combat system in this game, the deep strategy behind it is really to manage the various abilities your companions and Rook have in concert. So in this case, Harding has a combo opportunity with Shred. It's going to apply the Sunder the Sunder effect and deal a high amount of stagger. Now you'll notice I can combo that with Rook's ability Spirit Bomb. That's going to cause a detonation combo. Cara, que doideira. So, and one of the things you'll notice about the train here is it's very muita opção. The Crossroads is a realm that reflects the waking world. In this case, it's an amalgamation of all the real world spaces that are tied to it. In the case, we've got Hosburgh, we've got other mountainous regions. So it's kind of this mix of the swamp. And as you'll see, as we move towards these alluvians, 
the architecture around them very clearly reflects what's on the other side. We're not going to spoil it and tell you exactly what's on the other side, but you maybe make a few guesses based on what you're seeing. Do I have to do the crossroads or can I just fast travel right through? So it depends how you progress through the game. Uh, the first time you go to any of the new regions in the world, you'll traverse the crossroads to get there. Subsequent times, we of course support fast travel, but it behooves you to actually go back and explore the crossroads as some of the deepest secrets lie within. So now you're in Hosberg Wetland. It's an area that has been almost completely consumed by the blight. The Grey Wardens have set up an outpost here. Again, you know anything about the Grey Wardens, they fight the blight anywhere they see it. And they're noticing something strange is going on here. The blight is not behaving as they expect it to and as it, as it historically has. So they've set up shop in this uh, place called Lavendale and you are here to work with them, help them out and help them find an answer to the questions about the blight that they're asking. Tell me a little bit more about this area. It looks a little bit like a, a hub where you can get a lot of quests and things like that. That's right. So here we find one of the bases of the Grey Wardens. So you'll see they've really built up a small fighting force here to hold off the dark spawn. What's more, the Grey Wardens are a faction we're gonna be working with throughout the game. We've got Holden, one of the Grey Warden Quartermasters. We're actually gonna upgrade his shop is. and see what items he has in store for us, see if maybe it gives us an edge in combat. And the Grey Wardens, much like the other factions, they understand the stakes of the gods being out. They want to help you, but you need to help them first. They have, again, as Kryn mentioned, they're holding off the, the dark spine here. They have other priorities, so getting them more powerful allows them to more meaningfully contribute to your fight against the elven gods. Got him, Bowman. All right, so we're heading out of the Grey Warden <laughs> Fortress into the small town of Lavendel. Now, this used to be a beautiful place full of life, flowers, and you can see what effect the blight has had. But the residents are still here. They're trying to make the most of their lives, and you can see there's plenty of opportunities to help them. Cara, o que vai ter de missão secundária lá, ó? Nossa, mano, a gente vai hibernar nesse jogo, galera. Vai ter tanta coisa para fazer. One of the focuses of this game is characters, not causes. I've been busy with patients, but I'm short on medical supplies. My mentor, Oscar, he should have some. He has a cabin outside the village. If you're out there, tell him you saw Flynn, and they could use his help. And Flynn is a warden who you will do quests with. We wanted to make sure that the side content of Dragon Age of the Veilguard felt as meaningful and tied to the overall conflict of the game as anything else you do. We don't want to, you to just go off and do random tasks. Everything needs to feel meaningful, either contributing Legal, to isso aí. or contributing to the growth of your companions and your the isso, faction that mano. you need at your side to stop it. Ó, oh, o que ele tá dizendo aqui, se eu entendi direito, vou até voltar ali para ter certeza, é que não são missões secundárias aleatórias perdidas, tá ligado? O que realmente tem muito em alguns jogos de RPG que a gente joga, né? E é aquilo que eu sempre comento com vocês, cara. Vai colocar missão secundária? Que seja missão secundária que faça sentido, que agregue a lore do próprio jogo, a história que está sendo contada. E se ele estiver falando a verdade aqui, se eu entendi bem isso, é o que eles colocaram nesse jogo, cara. Isso é muito legal. Eu vou até voltar. We Dragon Age of the Veilguard felt as meaningful and tied to the overall conflict of the game as anything else you do. We don't want to you to just go off and do random tasks. Everything needs to feel meaningful, either contributing to your fight against the gods or contributing to the growth of your companions and your the factions that you need at your side to stop the gods. You look a bit worried. We're not sure where some of our wardens are, Beckett and a few others. We're supposed to check in. We need to look out for each other more than ever. It's just, I know they took Weiss help hard and I hope they're okay. All right, so we picked up a couple of quests in Lavendel, but we're here to help Davrin. So we're going to make our way through the perils of Hosberg and try to get to this Warden Fortress of the Cauldron. Seeing a lot of kind of organic matter, I suppose that's the blight. Absolutely. So the blight at this point, as mentioned before, the Wardens understand it's changed. It's become a lot more organic, a lot more alive. You back in Dragon Age 2, Inquisition, Origins, the Blight, while it was a slow moving wall, it didn't have this almost sentience, this almost 
thought behind it. And obviously we've talked about how the gods that are out are blighted. That probably has something to do with it. And it's made this area far more dangerous than it would have been before. Cara, como tá bonito, and you mano. might notice as we get into combat with some of these dark spawn that they do look a little bit different than before. And that's very intentional. Gilanane, the god of monsters, she uses blight like a medium to sculpt and warp the dark spawn to do her bidding, to suit her purposes. So right now you'll see a couple of herlocks, uh, one with some pretty disgusting gross on its back. Again, the idea that the dark spawn and the blight is an organic weapon. They're not just coming out and, you know, making swords, making armor. They're using the blight to augment themselves so they can more effectively defeat you and also give the god. Cara, a vida do cara é enorme. All right. Now, I'm actually going to switch to my orb and dagger on the mage. And those of you that were fans of the Night Enchanter in Dragon Age Inquisition, you might feel right at home with this. This is a more melee focused, more agile version of the mage. One of the main mechanics here is you can use this elemental orb to apply stacks of elemental damage to the enemy and then unleash them with your dagger to detonate them. Você vai morrer, cara. So, again, we're in uh you'll notice that there are blight pools. The dark spawn aren't just coming out of nowhere. The blight is spawning them again. Part of Gilanane's attempt to turn this into an army for the gods is to use these darkspawn, not just, again, whereas you have the Venatori and the Antom, one case representing magical power and the other case representing physical strength, the darkspawn are representing overwhelming force. That was a pretty clutch heal a little earlier, by the way. You know, we've talked at length before that uh, our fans have asked us, where is the healing magic? Can you bring it back? And uh, Nev in this game, happy to oblige with a kit of healing spells. Tá, vai ter healing. So one Healer. of the interesting things that I love about our companions is each of them, their abilities, the way that they're built, they're very thematically appropriate to the character. They're very focused on making sure that the gameplay and the narrative are as closely aligned as possible in the case of Nev versus Blar versus uh, Amric, our mages, each of them has a healing ability that is thematically appropriate to them. It makes sense when you know them as a character. Watching you play, I'm struck by sort of the size and the scope of this particular area. It seems like there's a, a lot of exploration that I can be doing right here. That was really one of our goals with these areas. Of course, we are a mission-based game, but we really emphasize player autonomy. You can revisit these spaces. They're full of uh -huh. secrets, puzzles, some pretty incredible bosses and treasure. Mm. And of course, as we saw earlier in Lavendel, some really Man, narratively rich side quests. <laughs> One thing that's interesting is you'll find we're going on a quest for Davern, but Davern is not currently in our party. That's because Davern has gone ahead of us and is waiting for us at the Cauldron. É bom esse tipo de gameplay, cara, pra gente poder entender como o game é cru e nu, tá ligado? Sem corte. While they won't complete the quest on their own, they will go ahead and get things ready. So when you get there, you can have a, you talk to them, you have a conversation with them, and it feels like they are as invested in the success of their journey, their stories, as you are. This looks like a, a pretty contiguous zone, is that right? It is, yes. Yeah, so it's full of branching paths, different areas to explore. And what I love is the more content you do in the area, the more shortcuts you're going to discover, uh, you're really going to have a lot more flexibility in how you navigate between your remaining missions and quests. Well, I think something really interesting, too, about the way that our team has built these spaces is there's the idea of each space has its own story to tell. And while those quests, you know, we talked earlier about those quests and side quests being narratively, narratively, narratively relevant, they also contribute to a more of a meta narrative meta story about the space itself. So in the case of Hosberg, we talked about how this is an area surrounded by blight, and you're kind of getting to the center of what exactly is going on in Hosberg and Lavendel, and these quests that you do, and the content Corinne is currently engaged in, helps to tell that story. All right. We can see our companions are up here attacking this uh, dark spawn on their own. Let's give them a quick hand.
E aí, galera? Ascensão da EA ou não? O que vocês acham? Tá bonito isso aqui, velho. Caramba, eu não consigo despregar o zóio, velho. Legal. A voz desse maluco What é demais. Né? And what have they been hiding inside? So something tore through the gate. That's probably not great. Looks like we should probably get moving. We won't find out standing around here. Be ready for anything. So because we don't have Davern in our party, he's going to move ahead and wait for us while we bring Nev and Harding along to clear a way, clear a path for ourselves to find Davern and get to where he is. Can you talk a little bit about how Nev and Harding uh, sort of synergized during the combat? Yeah, so Nev and Harding, uh, Nev is a mage, Harding is a rogue, and each of the classes, and you can build and party entirely of one class if you want, but the idea is that the classes synergize and they can set up and detonate each other's abilities in a very interesting way. Now, tá. Você pode escolher, você vai escolher uma classe, aí em sinergia com você, você pode colocar ali, como a gente tá vendo aqui embaixo, ó, parece que tem dois, né? Uma aqui e outra aqui, ó. Outros personagens de classe diferente para te acompanhar. E mediante ao personagem companion que você colocar, é possível combar golpes, que é o que ele fez lá atrás que a gente viu, né? Escolhendo o golpe do mago junto com o golpe da mina, que dava aquela explosão muito louca. Eu acho que é isso. Legal, hein? You can, again, as I said, you can have a all rogue party, all mage party, all warrior party, it ah still works. But in this case, uh, Nav and Harding are Dá até pra colocar and todo mundo da mesma classe e tal. Olha lá, ó, tá vendo lá em cima? So we're in danger here, and this is really what I love about the tactical layer of combat. If you get in that clutch situation where you've got this devastating incoming attack, great time to pause gameplay weigh your options and in this case i'm going to go back to our combo here and uh see if i can just quickly get out of the way <laughs> Olá, legal, All right. que doideira. applied siphoning to these enemies so i'm actually going to be leeching their health when i use my mage beam Vou apanhar para entender de início, mano, mas depois quando pegar o negócio vai é ficar doido, cara. Que legal. Area, and that's part of our philosophy on the combat encounters. If I don't destroy these blight boils, ghouls are going to continue to emerge. So I'm really focused on what targets tá. do I take down first. This enemy is a little bit weaker. I think I'm going to have my companions focus on them while I deal with this grenadier that's given me some problem. <laughs> Yeah, I, I will say, and that's I know I'm not on the stick. Kryn is much more, much better at this game than I am. And this <laughs> you say particular. that? <laughs> well, most of the time, yes, 100%. Uh, but uh, each enemy, again, really leaning into the organic. The, what I love about the Grenadiers is they basically rip off pieces of themselves and throw them at you, which explode as blight. And again, really leaning to the idea that the blight is organic and disgusting. One thing that I'm noticing is Recuperou that the, uh, the combat encounters can get pretty intense. You end up fighting a lot of different enemies. Nossa, you can morrer. absolutely die if you're not careful. Yes, and this, uh, as we mentioned earlier, this is uh, well into the game. So combat counters have really ramped up. And it really shows the importance of positioning, using your companions wisely, and looking for those synergies and combos. É, foi yeah, derrotado. This is interesting. We just went down. <laughs> We've built our companions to be able to come to our aid. So we're actually going to use a revive here. Mm. And Nev to the rescue. And as Corinne mentioned, this is later in the game. And Hosberg itself is a, what I would consider a later game area. Um, and the encounter is a little bit more challenging. It's a more dangerous space. This shows up in the encounter, but it also shows up in the visuals, the storytelling here. This is a place that You don't want to be. You don't want to be in Hosberg. It is full of dark spawn, full of blight, and generally not a pleasant place to be. 
<risos> well, okay. we'll be able to explore more of the Vocês estão achando? When Dragon Age the Veil Guard comes Tô gostando, out velho. O que vocês estão achando? First. In the meantime, we are going to be continuing on with our IGN um jogo first coverage of Dragon Age for the rest é legal, of September. And for everything that's great about games and RPGs, keep it locked on IGN. Beleza, beleza. Esse foi o primeiro gameplay estendido, né? E assim, mano, de cara, pô, bonito. Como eu falei, complexo, né? Isso é legal, um jogo complexo pra você entender as mecânicas. Mas depois que pega, com certeza vai ficar tão OP quanto esse cara aqui. Pode mesclar tanta coisa coisa, cara, tantas habilidades e eu acho que o fator replay desse jogo vai ser muito rico você pode jogar ele completamente ó, eu não sei quantas classes tem no game mas você vai poder jogar uma vez com cada classe principal mesclando as classes, colocando companions de classes diferentes ou iguais à sua, fazendo escolhas e missões diferentes da, da maneira com que você fez na run anterior cara, isso aqui vai ser gigante Vamos pro próximo vídeo. O próximo vídeo deles é de é um preview mesmo, né? It's been 10 long years since Dragon Age Inquisition and the expectations for the next Dez game anos, mano, é muita Dragon coisa, Age né? Seem impossible. A full decade, a bevy of behind the scenes changes and an interesting start Nossa, como tá, mano, decade, como tá bonito isso aqui, velho. behind the scenes change. Ó, é essa arte que eu tô falando para vocês, mano, que eu acho incrível. Parece um desenho Pixar. Sei lá. Changes and an interesting start to its marketing campaign made me a little worried for my most highly anticipated game of the year. I admire you when you've been through would break most people. But one of my biggest concerns, based on early previews, was that it could be headed in the direction of being a linear action game rather than its more open world predecessor. While Dragon Age is known for changing its style with each installment, I hoped dearly that it wouldn't lose too much of the DA DNA I fell in love with. After hours of hands-on time spread across two days, I'm pleased to say that I walked away with excitement and curiosity, but mostly relief to wave many of those concerns goodbye. Legal. My time with the Veil Guard covered a wide smattering of things, including the incredibly expansive character creator, the introductory quests, a faction mission and a companion quest a little deeper into the game. But I was mostly pleased with my ability to just explore Northern Thetis and all its gorgeously designed glory, experiencing a setting in Dragon Age lore that we've really only heard about. To be clear, the Veil Guard isn't the open world playground that Inquisition was. As game director Corinne Bush has previously stated, it's more mission based. But what impressed me after the first few hours was how much exploration can still be done in the various regions, Bacana. as well as the impact the player character, Rook, can have on those regions. And there we go, easy. Wow, isn't that something? Consider it something of a mix of Dragon Age 2 and Inquisition, the more streamlined approach of the former with the geographically and sociopolitically diverse world of the latter. Of course, some of the bigger art style, combat, and gameplay changes will be subject to personal taste. But after my time with the Veil Guard, I left feeling like these 10 long years just might have been worth the wait. As fans have already seen from the first gameplay trailer, players are dropped right into the city of Minrathis in the middle of the action as Solus prepares a ritual that will devastate Thetis. Luckily, our old friend Varric has recruited you to help, and it barely takes a couple of minutes for the game to put the focus on Rook. After a surprisingly concise story recap from Varric, there are a number of aspects the Veil Guard starts easing you into. Que bonito. For one, the combat. Gone are the days of Dragon Age Origins' more CRPG-inspired tactical system, offering a style that's a mix of quick action and a mechanic where you can pause and pull up your radial menu. While this absolutely does take some getting used to, and it'll be a gradual process to create what could be a highly customized build while learning all your companions' different abilities, it didn't take me long to actually start having fun with it. Peraí, vocês viram ali? I largely played mage and... Peraí, vocês viram ali? Como que... Sabe aquela árvore que abre no momento que pausa o jogo? Você It monta ela. High... Olha lá, ó. Que doideira, velho. Nossa, mano. 
vai ser um jogo gigante. Quando você customiza a build, enquanto você aprende todas as suas companhias diferentes habilidades, não me levou tanto tempo para realmente ter fun com isso. Eu largamente jogava Mage e Rogue builds durante o meu tempo de mão, e também rápido comecei a se levar em algumas habilidades companhias. Por um lado, a habilidade de Mage Healing foi essencial. For one particularly difficult remnant, I basically established a pattern where I was only using Bellara's mana to heal me, dodging and playing it safe when it got too risky. Legal. Mage's ability to slow time was also one I kept returning to, offering a bit more control on the battlefield oh. when the situation got a little too fast paced. Que louco, mano. Caramba. If you blast cannon builds out there, you'll want to have a warrior around to taunt your enemies out of your way. Você monta do jeito que você quiser mesmo, cara. Like a whole lot in the Veilguard, combat revolves around your companions, even though you can't fully take control of them like in previous Dragon Age games. Different companions have different combo options together, and there are certainly opportunities to build team synergy. Oh, and you'll want to listen to your companions in combat too, as they'll occasionally drop some useful hints. But combat aside, your dialogue choices, Nossa, mano, your background, and the frequent decisions you make are immediately important, which shouldn't be too surprising for fans of Bioware games. The dialogue wheel is back, of course, as is the approval disapproval system. We haven't got a lot of time. They're excited. Não, eu aprovo e muito, cara. Nesse tipo de game é essencial. But I was surprised to see that the Veilguard actually Cara, eu tô impressionado com os bonecos, mano. <laughs> Eu tô impressionado com os bonecos. Tá muito, muito bonito, cara. Meu Deus do céu. Tá muito bonito. Olha a expressão, cara. Mas o que, eu mais, o que mais me chama atenção é realmente a escolha artística. Caramba. Explains the consequences of some of your dialogue choices in very clear terms. See, you say that. It's a variation of the so and so will remember that system, but more specific. But we do have Nev's location now, so... Take, for example, my first confrontation with Solus, a.k.a. Fen'Harel, a.k.a. the Dreadwolf. I chose a more sarcastic, humorous approach with him, and at the end of our confrontation, text on the side of the screen informed me that I have traded verbal jabs with Solus. This is your responsibility now. It was far from the only occurrence of this sort of text, and it leaves me curious as to how your relationships with various characters will build and branch out over time based on your attitude. Speaking of consequences, it quickly became clear to me that there would consistently be tons of choices in the Veil Guard that'll have lasting results. It probably sounds like I'm stating the obvious here, but I got the sense that even more of these kinds of choices might be peppered throughout than the usual Bioware game. Right at the beginning, for instance, I made a choice that led to Harding getting injured, and she was still bruised up for the remainder of the next couple hours. Caramba. I felt like a real jerk about it, and <laughs> that was probably the point. Dragon Age the Veil Guard seemed to be Caraca. telling me, right from the start, that I'm going to feel like a jerk a lot. You Nossa. don't slow down for much, do you? Without spoiling too much, you'll also be able to see some of your progression and choices in the environment around you as well. But once introductions were out of the way, it was time to explore the wide world of Thetis and see its past and present collide. Shall we? Let's do this. As mentioned earlier, one of my biggest worries was that the Veil Guard could end up being more linear in its approach. Trading branching gameplay for a straight line. And sure, the opening hours, essentially the tutorial zone, are a little railroady, save for a couple key decisions you have to make. But once you're past that and more established with an Act 1, you're much more free to tackle quests as you please as you unlock more and more regions. You do this via the crossroads. For those of you who aren't brushed up on your Dragon Age lore, That's a nexus between the waking world of Thetis and the metaphysical realm of the Fade, through which the ancient elves would travel through magical mirrors called Alluvians. You now use the Alluvians for that same purpose, and to unlock new regions, you have to fight through certain areas of the crossroads before you can start fast travel. Legal. Unlocking said regions opens up a vast network of areas, and not unlike past Dragon Age games, they're dramatically different from one another. As the gods champion. Take, for example, the Arlithan Forest, a gorgeous, colorful region that mixes greenery with elven magic. You can see nugs burrow Nossa, into the bonito, grass, mano. magical artifacts abound, and there's a vast array of nature to simply admire. You're hit with a massive tone shift, however, when you head to Hosberg. Lavendel Village. Whatever happened here looks like Demeter's Crossing. 
Currently under siege by the Blight, here is where you'll see some of the more horror-inspired aesthetics, and frankly, just some of the grosser aspects of the Blight. While the Veilguard's tone certainly leans more high fantasy in places like the Crossroads, don't worry. Those who miss the gore and dark fantasy of Origins will find that too in places where the Blight has spread. But I couldn't help but spend a lot of my time just running around in Treviso, the bustling city that's home to the Antivan Crows faction. For one thing, a lively city feels like a novelty in Dragon Age. But there was simply so much to explore that I kept getting sidetracked. A merchant with unique items here, a new quest to pick up over there, and a random combat encounter over there. And that's just when I wasn't looking around for a cat or dog to pet. Because yes, you can pet the cats and dogs. <laughs> Claro. Outside of the cats and dogs, there are some unique ways to interact with the environment as well. Each companion has an environmental ability, some of which came in quite handy for me. In my time in the Arlithan Forest, I frequently called upon Bellara, whose environmental ability allows her to tinker with magical artifacts. In a nice quality of life feature, your companions don't even need to be in your party in order cara, to Cara, esse, esse negócio de though. companheiros aí vai ser essencial pelo jeito, né, cara? Is the fact that party banter Escolher bem. Up again later if you trigger combat, a cut scene or anything else that would interrupt their dialogue. That's right. No more awkward standing around in order to hear the complete conversation. Oh. Yes. If you're feeling overwhelmed, the difficulty and accessibility options do allow for about just as much or as little hand-holding as you need. For example, with one Antivan Crow's quest I was doing, I could turn the navigation on and simply follow the game's guidance, or turn it off and look for clues in the environment to follow. In this tá. case, the Crow's purple symbol, painted on certain walls. Legal, legal. Pra saber, você pode habilitar ou desabilitar. Existem, pelo que eu tô vendo aqui, né, existe um foco em acessibilidade. Então, a cada missão que o jogo for dando, você pode sim sair procurando pistas e chegar no lugar correto, que deve ser o modo exploração, né? Ou você pode colocar pontos, né, pra, que vão te guiar ao lugar que você tem que ir. Pô, legal. Serve para todo mundo, né? I also just happen to be playing an Antivan Tem quem vai usar e quem não vai usar, quest, legal. Which led to some fun dialogue options. We crows are all the army Antiva has, but it's not like we can feel the garrison. Once I was in the thick of things, I could clearly see the features in the Veil vale Guard that boiled down to, okay, okay, we heard the complaints about Inquisition, specifically addressing the infamous Hinterlands problem, which is a reference to the first open world area players visit in Inquisition. The zone was packed with more than 50 side quests, many of wow. which boiled down to mere fetch quests, and it left many players drowning in a bevy of checklists that felt inconsequential to the story. The Veil vale Guard has boiled this down quite a lot. You're still free que to bom, explore, olha lá. the scope isn't nearly as dizzying, and the quest point back to the main story. Ah lá, isso é legal, é o que a gente tava falando, mano. Another clear reaction to criticisms of Inquisition are our villains in the Veil Guard, Elgrenon and Gilanane. The two elven gods feel much more present throughout the events of the early game than Corypheus, the frankly lackluster baddie of Inquisition. Whatever comes, we're ready for a fight. Words easily said, but rarely proven. While there's a whole lot more Thetas to see and talk about, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring it back home to the lighthouse. Too louco, velho. The lighthouse will likely be the most important location of the Veil Guard, serving as the hub for you and your companions. Each one of your companions has their own room, and conveniently, a light shines outside of their door when they have a cutscene available. Once you get further into Act 1, it certainly starts to feel more lived in, and you can discover some pretty charming character quirks. For example, I found that Emmerich's skeletal assistant Manfred enjoys spending time on the balcony, and we even got a few games of rock, paper, scissors in. The lighthouse is also, obviously, where you're able to do some housekeeping, especially when it comes to the caretaker. Offer, dweller. I will answer. This wildly helpful spirit is always standing by to help you enchant and upgrade armor for you and your companions. Legal. But I found the lighthouse somewhat symbolic of one of the biggest challenges this game is facing, bringing in new players while honoring the now incredibly vast lore that Dragon Age has built across the games, comic books, short stories, and more. Basically, if you were worried that the name change from Dragon Age Dreadwolf would mean less Solus, think again. His history, along with the history of the other elven gods, is baked into the lighthouse. And you learn more and more about the threat you face as you unlock Solus's murals with various wolf statues. You even get to see some of his memories firsthand. They need gods who can protect them. We are not gods. You will learn that. 
As a lore nerd, I very much appreciated this, as well as the various other callbacks to series history. The Origins fans will likely love the Grey Warden heavy quests, and we already know the Inquisitor will be involved in some way, as you can recreate them and select your world states in the character creator. But I do wonder if it'll overwhelm new players, which Bioware certainly seems to be courting with its action-heavy combat system. That's why it helps, at least, to have something of an outsider like Rook to take the helm of the Veilguard. Plus, the scrappiness of Rook reminded me a bit of playing as Hawk in Dragon Age 2, rather than the more Chosen One-esque protagonists of the Warden in Origins and the Inquisitor in Inquisition. In short, a lot changed in Dragon Age the Veilguard, but there was so much I was relieved to see stay. The focus on companions and romance, the rich lore, and a gorgeous world to explore. It goes without saying that there's still a ton of the Veilguard that I haven't seen, especially if it's as big as Origins and Inquisition, and it certainly seems Puta like it. Man, but after finishing go, my man. preview, I found myself even more eager to dive into it, and much more hopeful that this could be the hit Bioware needs. It's been ten. Cara, me convenceu a jogar. Tem mais coisas ainda pra gente ver, calma, o vídeo tá ficando enorme, eu sei, mas eu tô tentando nele, galera, chegar de novo pra próximo do game, né? Como eu falei pra vocês, a gente ficou muito tempo sem ver as novidades por conta de Black Myth o Kong, é, o Astrobot e tantos outros lançamentos recentes, mas, e agora eu quero ver tudo, entendeu? Então vão tendo paciência aí e vamos vendo comigo, cara, mas esse, esse preview aqui ficou muito robusto, mas parece um review, né, isso porque a mina não viu tudo, né, cara, legal, legal demais, o que, que vocês acharam? Eu não conheço, tá, Dragon Age, sou, tô chegando agora, né, não vou sentar na janelinha, por isso eu quero entender o máximo de, de coisas que eu puder, tentar jogar o Inquisition, pelo menos, né, mas vocês que são fãs e que já acompanham há um bom tempo, falem pra mim, o que vocês estão achando? Legal? Não? Eu, como alguém que não conhece, que está chegando agora, tudo está sendo muito convidativo. É o tipo de jogo que a gente gosta aqui no canal, né? RPGs massivos em terceira pessoa, que encontra roupinha, que faz upgrade, que tem história bacana, que tem escolhas interessantes e que mudam o enredo. Tudo está muito convidativo para mim. E para você também? Tá Bora ver o quão grande e satisfatório é agora né? a... a criação de personagens. After 10 years, we're now just a little over a month away from playing Dragon Age The Veil Card. I played a hefty seven hours of Bioware's first original game since Anthem in 2019 and fourth mainline installment in the Dragon Age series, starting with the prologue and later loaded into several different saves. As a longtime fan, what I'll say is 10 years is a very long time, but so far, the Veil Guard hasn't disappointed. I've never seen this before. There's something kind of exciting about it. Now, I could talk to you about the combat, and I will, or the gorgeous locales, that's coming too, or the way it felt to see Varric and Solus again. Hey, Chuckles. Hope I'm not interrupting. Or, I could skip straight to the character creator and start with, There's so much hair. Look, I loved Dragon Age Inquisition. Oh, Inquisition. But fans have long acknowledged the limitations of its character creator. The Veil Guard blew me away in that regard. After the lackluster options of the last entry, it's wild to see what we've got to look forward to. 30 hair options for Kunari. 30 opção de cabelo. 88 complete with gorgeous Caramba, physics man. as Rook scurries around Northern Thetis. So many different hair textures are represented, whether you'd like totally straight hair, 2B waves, or 4C curls. In making my character, I was drawn immediately to a long braid that whipped around as quickly as I did. 
Kunari horns also see a massive improvement. With 49 unique styles, options range from large Meu Deus, cara, é muita coisa, 49. Or even asymmetrical. That said, yes, their foreheads can look pretty jarring. I played as a Kunari mage during most of my preview and will say I got used to the look pretty quickly. Dragon Age: The Veil Guard actually only marks the second game of the series where you can play. Tatuagem a rodo. So the odd and balance of forehead versus face feels like stylistic growing pains. I remain curious about whether more time with the character creator might help. The air shock of Dragon Age 2 is, in my opinion, such a beautifully crafted model, and I would love to be able to create a Kunari rook that feels as memorable. Customization certainly doesn't stop at hair or horns, of course. Every aspect of your rook is editable, even allowing for facial asymmetry if you choose. Sliders allow you to change everything from head shape to the melanin in your skin to the presence of vitiligo. Perhaps my favorite, addition, however, is the introduction of body diversity. Cyberpunk 2077 and Baldur's Gate 3 had whiffs of this, but nowhere near what you're capable of in the Veil Guard. Caramba, ultrapass. Oh, dra oh, Dragon's, Dragon's Dogma. For each of the four races, there are plenty of presets to choose from, all with varying heights and muscle or fat distribution. Once you've chosen your preset, however, you can build further upon those elements as much as you'd like. First is a triangulation Cara. of coordinates, allowing for many unique combinations of body types that are thinner, larger, or more muscular. Height sliders are fun, especially when it means watching my particularly short elf ruin years of Solus's ritual planning by pushing over a statue. The options feel almost endless. There's even a glute slider. And yes, I gave my rook one hell of an ass. <laughs> is only scratching the surface. I haven't even gotten into facial hair, makeup, scars, or tattoos. As an elf, my rook sported some Valaceline, but there are so many different designs Ai, que linda que ficou o personagem dela. to experiment with. While I didn't spend very much time exploring customization for the Inquisitor, I just know we'll all get the chance to make them in the way we've always imagined. It's good to see you again. Also, it may be a relief to some of you to know that Veilguard abandons the awful green lighting of Inquisition's character creator and instead allows you to cycle through several lighting options in service of ah, just as good in gameplay as they do when you create them. Combat, meanwhile, was a refreshing change from Inquisition. My go-to class has always been mage, and even as a knight enchanter, I often felt like I was standing in one place holding down the left trigger. This felt like a return to the pace of Dragon Age 2, with innovations that approve upon the experience of battle overall. The Veil Guard introduces a new fighting style for mages featuring an orb and dagger for close quarters combat. It's tailor-made for players like me who love magic, but also really like to stab. During my preview, I played through the prologue and then dropped forward into various points of Act 1, so I really got to quickly experience the progression Rook and their companions can go through as fighters. We may not be able to take control of our companions this time around, but the Veil Guard really encourages strategizing with them. They'll call out to you when they've rebuilt their mana or stamina, and the ability wheel even suggests combos. My focus during the event was mission-driven, so I didn't get as much of a chance to interact with the characters as I would have liked, but even the brief moments of banter endeared me to them pretty quickly. It didn't break. You call that nice and quiet? Each class gets its own ultimate ability. Think the focus. Whoa. Ability, along with a ranged attack. For warriors, that means yeeting your shield like a giant metal boomerang. É, com certeza eu vou de guerreiro primeiro. Não vai ter como. With this new system, I had so much fun. I felt present during every encounter and truly accomplished after every boss battle. That said, there's definitely a bit of a learning curve. I still found myself confusing controls a few hours in. 
It's a departure from all three installments, but luckily the Veil Guard offers five different difficulty levels that you can change well if you want to ease yourself. Hmm. Pode mudar durante o jogo. As a Dragon Age fan, the Veil Guard felt like a homecoming of sorts. Just as much as seeing familiar faces in Solus and Varric, I was overjoyed to be back in the world of Thetis itself. Moving us north allows for that sense of discovery I got in Inquisition. And if I'd encourage anything, it's to really look at your surroundings. Not only are there small environmental puzzles to entangle along with small and effective moments of visual storytelling, but the horizon is Nossa, que lindo, mano. breathtaking scenery that drives home the scale of these locations I've personally always wondered about. One new locale, for instance, is a gorgeous underwater prison called the Ossuary. I won't spoil what you're there to do, but the design alone makes it one of the most memorable moments I've had in any Dragon Age game. Even Caramba. after hours of gameplay, I still felt like I could have played for many hours more. I'm optimistic about the Veil card and excited for it in a way I haven't quite felt about another game in quite some time. If you'd like to see even more of the game, Check out our exclusive IGN first coverage, which features even more gameplay and deep dives on Rook's companions. Come and on. for everything else in the world of video games, stick with IGN. Legal, legal. Para final, oh, nossa, desculpa. <risos> Para finalizar, obviamente, vamos dar uma espiada no vídeo do Luck, né? Nossa, galera, não vamos não. <risos> O vídeo dele é de 40 minutos, velho. Então, fica o convite aqui para que vocês possam lá e dar uma olhada no vídeo do Luck, ver o que ele falou, tá? Eu vou ver em off e tal, mas gravar aqui... Mano, a gente já tá com 51 minutos de vídeo, né? Eu não vou colocar mais 40 minutos de vídeo, acho que ficaria muito, muito grande e vocês vão ficar muito cabreiro comigo. Mas por hora... O que eu posso dizer do que eu tenho visto aqui é que o game realmente parece daqueles RPGs massivos, complexos, grandes e que vai nos pôr para explorar e para rejogá-lo várias vezes de maneira diferente. Graficamente eu achei maravilhoso, o combate parece muito bacana. Eu joguei um pouco do Inquisition e, embora ele seja legal e tal, não é o tipo de combate que eu gosto, né? Pô, aqui tá muito melhor, tá mais ação nas magias, as coisas aradas na tela. Gostei do que eu vi, galera. Confesso pra vocês que vai estar tá no meu radar e, obviamente, né, quando o jogo sair, esse é o tipo de jogo que eu acho que eu não recebo antecipado. Eu não tenho vínculo com a EA nenhum, né? Toda vez que eu tentei, nunca consegui né, uma resposta deles. Então, é bem provável que a gente não receba o game antecipadamente pra poder fazer análise e tal. Mas assim que o game sair, assim como o Kong, a gente joga aqui junto, vê qual é que é, solta as dicas conforme for né, avançando, né? E é isso, galera. Deixa a sua opinião, o que você achou por hora, pra mim, positivo.